So when we look at why digital products fail, there are a myriad of reasons. Now, of course, we can talk about you know, a number of specific problems that we find with digital products. Things like, you know, they can be kind of rude. Now, how are they rude? Well, they blame the user when they make mistakes. Even if it's their mistake. A problem with the product. It's always the user's fault. Now, I can't, I gotta tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've heard developers actually say that. Let me give you one example. Have I mentioned my example with one of my conversations with one of the user experience folks who works on um, Visual Studio? I haven't told you about that? All right, so I'm talking to one of the usability researchers who works at Microsoft, specifically on the Visual Studio uh, product. And of course, Microsoft has these fabulous, fabulous, brilliant developers. I mean, these are really smart people. They really, they are experts. They know their stuff. So when they went and designed Visual Studio, who do you think they designed it for? Themselves, right? Well, here's the problem. When you go into Visual Studio, they're working on various aspects of fixing this, but you would go into Visual Studio, and unless you were an expert, you're kind of sitting there lost. Like, what do I do? So this is something they tried to address. How do not just beginners, but average developers use Visual Studios, and what can we do to make it better? So the research team went, and they did some research, and with average developers, not Microsoft developers, average developers, and um, they came up with a plan and some changes that they were recommending, and they took them to the development team. And the development team looked at it and said, no, this is not the right way of doing things. They try explaining to them. Well, okay, but you know, we've done all this research. This is what works for the average developer. And what do you think their response was from the developers? Well, but they're doing it wrong. They just have to learn to do it the right way because they're doing it wrong. Now, how typical do you think that is? Very typical. We have a tendency to become experts in our own products. So we have a very different view of them. Now, I will tell you, ultimately, they were able to convince them, by the way. With a little flattery. But you know, you guys, you guys are the experts. You're better than everyone. You can't expect everyone to be as good as you. Oh, yeah, of course. A little flattery can go a long way. So uh, they actually have. Uh, started an online product that is more geared towards beginners and intermediates. Really quite interesting. But anyway, so I don't want you to think I'm just picking up Microsoft. <clears throat> so th you know, things, you know, things such as that. Because we as IT people, again, we tend to think of computers like computers, right? We're coding. We are coding as if we're dealing with a computer, except do you think our users are thinking about a computer as a computer, like we do? Yeah, no. What they're focused on is getting their job done. What is it that I need to be able to accomplish this? Let me give you a quick example. So a lot of times we assume people are technologically literate. Right, we assume they know about technology. Right? So, now when we want to, let's say we have a file, we want to rename it, we use Save As. Now at this point, we all are familiar with that. We're pretty familiar with Save As, right? Now, way, way back, before we all had our personal computers, what do you think would have made more sense to someone who's never dealt with a computer? Save As or rename, to rename a file. Probably rename. Now, of course, at this point, do you think it would be a good idea to change it? Yeah, not so much. Let me give you another example. This is an example that we currently have in Blackboard. 
maybe I'll even bring it up and show you. Now, this is a quick example. So in Blackboard, for instructors, there's an area where you can put your files for your courses. For a long time, it was called course files, right? We're used to going to a computer and looking for our files. Then they decided to change the name. I just happened to be in a training like a week after they changed the name. And of course, I looked at the name that they gave it, and I knew what it was, because thank you, I'm smart. Yes. <laughs> No, because I'm an IT person and this person was not. I think they were like in English or something. And this person goes up and says, what is content collection? Content collection. And I'm like, why on earth did they do that? Well, the answer was, oh, well, you know, we did have it named, con you know, course files, which makes sense to everyone. But we decided to rename it Content Collection because, you know, it's actually the collection of your content. Now, of course, my response, being the smart aleck that I am, see, do you really think anyone thinks of, thinks of it as course content? Or do you think they think of it as files? Well, it ends up, Everyone else in the room was like, they're files. They still haven't changed it. But that's just an example of assuming that we're going to know some sort of jargon, because that's used in their office, that we have user, as users had no clue about. Like, what is that? We do that in, in the IT industry all the time. Even something as simple as, what resolution is the image you're sending me? You guys know what that is, right? I hope so. Ask my father. He'll be like, huh? A what? <clears throat> now, digital products also exhibit poor behavior. How many times have you tried using a product where you have a certain flow to your work? Right? You know how you do things, and you have to open a window here and another window there to get it done. It's not quick and smooth. Anyone? I'll give you another Blackboard example. This tells you why I don't like Blackboard. All right. I go into Moodle. I can create a quiz. I just, with two clicks, I go to where I want it. I create the quiz. I have one nice page where I can choose my questions. I can set up all of the parameters that I need, how it's going to be graded, are the questions going to be randomized, all that fun and exciting stuff. I click OK, there it is, I am done. How many different areas of Blackboard do you think I need to go to to accomplish the exact same thing in Blackboard? It feels like 20. Anyone want to take a guess? Four. I have to go in one section and create the questions, which they call creating a test. Then I have to go to another section and create the test which they also call creating the test. Then I have to go at, to where I want to put it and add the test. Then I have to go to the course tools to respond to Lockdown Browser to turn on Lockdown Browser, which I can do all on one screen in Moodle, and turn that on. And then hopefully I'm done. I still will have to take one more step to check it. How excited am I about that? Yeah, not so much. How much cursing do you think I'm doing? A whole lot. So, why? I don't have an answer to that other than maybe they want to irritate me. That must be it. So, that's an example of a lot of times when we're designing these things, we're not thinking about the user. So, we just let the user do the heavy lifting. Right, instead of taking the five minutes it would take me to create a quiz in Moodle, it'll take me half an hour to do the exact same thing in Blackboard. Not a happy camper. <clears throat> so, why are products so bad? Well, we've talked about a lot of these things, right? We're, we don't think about our users, or we don't understand our users, we're ignorant about them. We have these conflicting interests. 
Who's developing it? Is it the marketers? Is it the developers? Is it the usability designers? Or there may be a lack of process. I need it quick, throw it together. Now there's no process. So when it comes to taking a user-centered design approach, a goal-centered design approach, we need to make sure that we can get all of this information. Now there are some challenges to that. Let's take a look at, say, ignorance of users. When you are developing a product, how easy do you think it is to actually connect with and talk to one of your potential users? A lot of times it's not easy. A lot of times designers and developers don't have any contact with potential users. Or it's very, very minimal. So it makes it very difficult to understand how a user is going to use a product. And if you don't understand that, how are you going to design a product that can meet the user's needs? Now later on in the semester, we're going to talk about some other techniques that you can use to try to gather some of this information. Because there are various ways that you can try to find users. And if you don't have access to users, other types of information that you can use to help understand what your users are trying to accomplish. I think we talked about all this stuff already. Let's see. We talked about programmers, you get to choose between ease of coding versus usability. We've talked about that several times in class already. Um, let's see. We talk, we've talked about a lack of process, where previously we talked about, well, you know, there's these in, our engineering mantra we talked about earlier in the semester, which is great, but there aren't some really strong design processes for user experience that are being developed. And that a lot of times there's not an advocate for the users. 